All right, James. So teaching during the pandemic is challenging, I imagine. And substitute teaching is probably even more challenging. How do children prank you over Zoom? <laughs> All right. So, I mean, at the begin at in September, I actually was at one school for the remainder of 2020, which obviously, you know, made things a little bit easier as far as like getting to know the kids and getting to know the system. Um, obviously during the pandemic, it's like all these different schools, they have different, um, communication platforms. Like some people use zoom, some people use Microsoft teams, some people use, uh, like Google. And, uh, yeah. it, it, it's like, so <laughs> number one, the biggest challenge is I literally had to learn all of those platforms and how to communicate and how to like divide the students up into groups and, you know, do all that stuff. So that, that was challenge number one. Challenge number two, obviously, I don't, I don't want to say anything crazy happened is over, but I mean, kids just straight up leave and totally. like, there's nothing you can do. Like you could like, like kids turn their cameras off and you're just sitting there and you're saying, you know, you know, Mike, no, we need to see your camera. And the kid doesn't respond. And and the thing is, there's only so much you can do. Like you can obviously contact home and, but like, it's just kind of one of those times where like the kids are probably able to get away with a lot more. I feel, you know, just yeah. based upon, <laughs> um, but you know, I've definitely heard, I've heard of some, some uh, pretty, pretty bad, like uh, infiltrations of, of meetings. Uh, of classes, you know, where like, uh, you know, my, um, my girlfriend's son, he, uh, someone like went on his zoom and like started like, just like swearing and like doing different things who like, wasn't a part of the class. It just like got in and yeah. like the teachers like scrambling, trying to, to get him <laughs> out of there, kick him out. But like, and then they have to like send some letter home about like, oh, well, so like, I know like security has definitely been an issue. Like I never really had anything too crazy, um, happen for like, uh, but like, I will say like, I mean, there's definitely kids just like who probably haven't attended one class the whole, the whole year, I bet. Yeah. Wait, so, like, so is that like, what, what was that? Was that like a zoom bombing situation? Yeah. Right? yeah. Was that before they, they updated the security settings? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I, that might've been, I would say maybe three, four months ago. So like, probably like they were still. You know? Oh yeah. Well, cause we, we had, cause we were doing online classes for the gym. Right. And I think we, we had one situation where we got zoom bombed. Um, I wasn't there, but someone came in and I think started just like using the like writing thing and started writing, uh, epithets, let's say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I was part of a, a discussion group as well, where someone got in and like took over the screen and started sharing porn. And that was funny yeah but there was also like adults who are part of a discussion group so we're like yeah cool fine <laughs> yeah on. no of course yeah you know obviously yeah when yeah when you're talking about children you know things get a lot more sensitive right. very quickly you know um and i will say too like just kind of based on the whole you know virus situation you know every school district i work in i mean it's also different how they're handling the virus so like that's a whole nother thing. It's like really politicized in like different counties, basically, you know, and, and how like people wanted to go back to school, you know, cause just when I was at teaching at that one school, um, I was there for four months. We went back to school. Then we had to go back to remote teaching. Then we went back to school again. You know, it was like this kind of back and forth where it's just like, I don't know how people expect you know, parents to, to have any sort of, <laughs> you know, consistency or the kids to have any consistency. Cause I know it's definitely taken a large toll on, on students. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame them for acting out to be honest and, and trying to be goofy. Cause it's just, it's been a total shit show in a lot of ways. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the challenges associated with any sort of remote meetings, remote 
you know, video calls, like all that kind of stuff, again, for adults are huge, right? That, that anyone who's been involved in Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call, it's just so challenging to retain any sort of focus and pay attention. And, you know, you just feel the constant pull to be like, I don't want to listen to this. I want to start looking at my email. I don't want to listen to this. I want to start looking at Twitter or whatever, right? And, yeah. you know, Im- imagining kids trying to self-regulate in that situation, um, assuming that they're even in a situation where they can sit down and actually spend time at the computer, right? Like that, that's, that's just, it's an unreasonable expectation. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and then the expectation that, you know, the parents to, to be there to help the kid is, is not reasonable as well. Cause like, you know, you're playing parent, you're, you know, you're going to work and then you're playing teacher and then, you know, any type type of help that needs to be had needs to be done obviously electronically, you know? So like, I don't know. I, I honestly thought that, I mean, I obviously, I believe that we needed to do the remote teaching just be, because of the severity of the virus. And, you know, I mean, just when I was back at school, I think um, 25% of staff was quarantining in the whole district. So you're, I mean, you only had three fourths of the, of the teaching staff available, which is not sustainable, obviously. Like, you know, so obviously I think it was necessary, but I just thought the whole situation for the, for the students is just, I mean, it's not good. It's not, I don't think they're learning anything. I think they're losing a lot of skills. I mean, there's obviously minimal socializing, which is very important, you know, especially in the early, you know, the early grades. So, you know, I don't, I don't really know what was a better solution, but I do know that it's probably going to have a negative impact on, on the, you know, students that are in school for at least, you know, at least another year, I would say. I mean, but we'll see, you know, we'll see how everything kind of pans out. Have have you, have you been back in school at all or has it all been remote? Oh yeah, I've been back. I actually um, started back in school, like going to school. Um, last week um and i think you know the the kids did are doing a pretty nice job with wearing masks and stuff but i mean it's just like it almost i I hate to say but it almost feels like prison in a lot of ways it's like students have to go into like a separate room to eat they can't sit by each other everything is like in these very like straight lines like you have to do it's just like you know it, it it's just, I feel bad. I mean, obviously, you know, that's the way it has to be for now, but it's definitely, you know, I think it's, it's just not, not doing what's the words. It's, it's just not like effective over a long period of time. You know, I I think, I think eventually if for some reason we had to continue to do it, like they, they're going to have to find another way. Yeah, well, I know when I was in high school, a lot of the new metal kids would wear uh, orange jumpsuits to school, and they wrote Lions Township Correctional Facility on the back. So they would definitely agree that high school is a prison. I mean, maybe they were just trying to fit in a slipknot or something. <laughs> you know, I, dude. It, you know, speaking of of metalheads in high schools, I don't think there's a group that I hated more in high school to be honest. Like metalheads specifically? Yeah, or man. Like new, like, metal, new metalheads. No, no. Just like, just all metalheads, like high school metalheads were like my least favorite because to me, that like they were just like posers. They like like Demo Borgia and like, you know, they would wear like fucking, no, I mean, at the time, you know, I just was like, dude, these kids suck. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I, f- I feel like we may have talked about this a little bit on the last podcast we did, but I actually don't remember. Uh, can, <laughs> I, can you, can, it, might, it might even be helpful to give a framework for what your typical outfit was when you were in high school. What were, what were you wearing at this time? 
So I mean, people can properly envision you hating someone who liked Demu Borgir. Yeah, I mean, at the time, it, yeah, it's like, okay, jeans, you know, Jordans, floor punch shirt, and then shaved head, to, you know, all the way down to the skin almost. That was that was how I, you know, and then obviously I had the straight edge varsity jacket with yeah. the big X. <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of, it, you know, it's at the time, yeah, it's like, okay, <laughs> If these if these if these kids don't like youth of today, then you know they're obviously shitty people, and I don't want to I mean, associate with them. Well, because I I met you probably around that time, right? Yeah. I don't know when we when we when we first actually met, but it was at some show at the fireside, probably two thousand two. Yeah, probably ballpark then, right? And I think you were there with Hofacker. And <laughs> Hofacker is like, oh, yeah, this is my friend, Youth Crew James. And I was like, that, that is, in fact, Youth Crew James. That is <laughs> a guy with a shaved head wearing a giant straight-edge varsity jacket. The, yeah, that, mean, is, that is Youth Crew James. <laughs> it's funny because it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. I just, it's funny because obviously in high school, I was like a jock in a lot of ways, right? Like I love sports. I like, I was on the sports teams. I lifted weights, but like, I didn't associate myself with, with those types of people. I always liked, you know, people who liked like punk music or, you know, hardcore music. And I, I obviously was stubborn, you know, at the time when it came to metal, cause obviously metal is like a thousand times better than like, every single hardcore band I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> at the time, you know, I didn't realize that a lot of the music I listened to was strongly influenced by metal. Like, you know, obviously New York hardcore is metal influenced completely. And I just thought like, oh, like, I mean, I, in my defense, you know, metalcore at the time was very, very questionable. You know, it, it was like a lot of the, you know, tight pants, extra small shirts, you know, it was Sweet like hair. Ben Phillips, you know, Dave Cronin, you know, they all loved, they all loved, you know, that, you know, hair in the eyes, you know, youth small bell bottoms or whatever those were at the time. So, you know, for me, it, you know, I just was like, I associated all metal with that, even though I know that's not how it was, but it was either like, okay, they like, like throw down, which like at the time I thought was, was lame and, or they like, you know, Metallica or Slayer, which, I always liked, but I didn't want to associate myself with those like people, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, as you grow, I think when I became like a senior, I got much less into like youth crew and started getting into like heavier music. Because ever since then, I mean, heavier music is like, it's not even close. Why, why, why do you think people who are in adjacent subcultures dislike the subcultures that are, they're not part of so much? <sighs> That's a tough question. I mean, it's funny because they're probably a lot alike in many ways, right? But yeah, right. Because to, to someone from the outside, they're like, you guys all like the angry kind of music. I don't understand what the problem is. Yeah, no, I mean, like, like to like a normal person, like they're unable to decipher hardcore from Slipknot. You know what I mean? Like it's totally. all the same to them. I think it's partly, I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to say elitism, but it's like, you're kind of like, you want to be like part of this unique culture. So you're always thinking that like, whatever you're a part of is more important or more unique than the other person. Right. And, you know, I sometimes find myself like, even like, Oh, like P 
people know about this band that I like, like, okay, I'm not really into that band as much anymore. Like I catch myself <laughs> doing that. Like it's not even, con- maybe not even conscious, but you know, I think, you know, that's a, I think that's a big part of, you know, why a lot of people get into, you know, some of these subgenres of music, you know, like no one can honestly listen to black metal and say, it sounds good to be honest. <laughs> Like no one could literally be like, oh, like I love that Dark Throne record. Sounds no, it sounds like someone buried a tape recorder and then took a shit on top of it. Like that is literally like, I mean, it's questionably not even music. (laughs) So why do people like it? Because it's unique, right? It has like a certain vibe around it. It has like a certain, you know. I guess it it comes with like this image as well, you know, like I'm hateful. I I don't like anything. I'm sketchy, you know? And I feel like that's kind of how all these different subgenres are. They kind of have like their own unique set of like, I can't, I'm trying to think of the word, but like just, they have like their own unique, like things. It's like a tribal marker. Yeah, like, like, you know, punks, like they like, you know, piercings and mohawks and vests and patches and crust punks don't like showering and bringing dogs to shows and, you know, hardcore kids, you know, they like wearing t-shirts and punching each other in the face. Like, like that is different, right? You know, and like, it's funny. Yeah, it's tribalism is is a good word because it's it's definitely it shouldn't be that way but it definitely is absolutely because like i mean you i mean you and i have been a part of it right like you know all oh, like these people like are infiltrating our show and we're gonna totally. like start a fight with them or whatever you know and like that that's what used to happen you know when people would come or metalheads used to come to hardcore shows or whatever. Like people would automatically target them, you know? Yeah. Well, and so it, it would be sort of like disguised under, you know, them violating some sort of unwritten code that they don't know about. Right. And it's like, course. yeah, maybe, maybe they were doing something that was annoying. Um, but really it was more like, you're not, you're not following the unwritten social code. Right. You're you're sort of more of just some like drunk punk guy who came to this hardcore show and like, yeah, you're bothering someone a little bit. But really, you've just you know, you 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 didn't follow the 25 rules about how you're supposed to behave at the show. So, you know, some some guy is going to is going to talk to you and, and, and potentially punch you in the face if you don't, you know, show proper respect. Right. It's like a weird. Yeah. And I mean, it's just. I also think it, it's part of, you know, a lot of these subgenres, you know, they draw certain types of people, you know, they draw outsiders, they draw people who have obviously some mental issues or, you know, they they have anxiety or they have social problems, you know, and obviously that uh, what comes with that is, you know, violence a lot of times, anger. And so usually it's easy to like, let that out on, you know, people who maybe don't belong so yeah that, that's how i always kind of viewed it of why as, as much as we are like in a lot of ways with all these different subgenres of music you know there's all these little details that separate people and you know a lot of people like it that way so i'm yeah. not i'm not sure it'll change no i don't think it will well because well, it, it i think you said something that that sort of aligns with one of my theories about it, right? Which is that, again, to people outside, it all seems kind of similar. Um, but on people, to people on the inside, these subtle differences between like, oh no, like you, your breakdowns go like this, but our breakdowns go like this, right? Like you guys have short hair, but we have long hair. You guys tremolo pick, but we sort of do like a fat records, right? It's like all these, you know, things that seem trivial, but it's, um, the, the potential misperception of someone else based upon those identity markers, I think, uh, makes them more salient, right? Cause it feels like someone is mischaracterizing your views. So you need to really separate yourself from the thing 
that's similar to your thing, but not quite like it, right? It's like if someone sure. has, you know, uh, slightly mischaracterizes your political views on something, right? Where they're like, oh, you, su- you know, something topical, you support this new stimulus bill because of X, Y, Z. And you're like, well, I do support it, but not for those reasons. Like I like it for this reason, right? It feels like so bad to have your, your view misunderstood or mischaracterized. And I think that having your identity misunderstood or mischaracterized is very upsetting to people. So they, they really try to parse those differences out. Yeah, that's a good, I mean, I think that's kind of a good way to look at it is like, I mean, a lot of, for a lot of people that is their identity, right? So you know, when, when there is a threat to your identity, right, you're going to try and, you know, defend it or separate yourself even more to, to say you're not like the other groups of people, you know, and, and, and it's, it's kind of funny because, I mean, obviously I get characterized as this guy who is like some jock who's like some tough guy who's like, you know, takes his shirt off and he's going to like go in the crowd and like beat people up and harm's way is like some mosh chug band. And like, obviously we know that that's really not, you know, the type of band that we are or the person that I am. Right. So, but like, I, I, you know, especially when we go into like the metal community, right. I think we get judged quite a bit based upon my appearance alone. Like people will write, write us off is just some like mosh hardcore band based upon how I look, you know, and, and and I've come to accept it, right. That that's going to happen no matter what, you know, and and you're going to be judged based upon your appearance a lot of times before anyone actually hears the music, you know? So it, it just further shows that, you know, a lot of these, you know, sub genres of music are just, you know, they don't like being, you know, told that they're also a part or similar to something else. Yeah. Well, I think with uh, with music and, and Harm's Way is a good example too, where there's a lot of different influences and there's a lot of different stuff going on in your music, right? I mean, even throughout your career too, right? I mean, the, you guys have had several different records with pretty different sounds as well. But of course, yeah. what 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 I think happens to people is that they they build a model of what they think is going to happen based upon some of those tribal identifiers, right? So they're like, oh, there's a guy with short hair with muscles who doesn't wear a shirt when he plays. Therefore, this is a tough guy hardcore band. And you can find tough guy hardcore stuff in Harm's Way Records, right? Like it's there. Right? Sure. And so like, but right. but if you if you only have that, if you're only looking for that and you're like, see, I found it, it's there. Tough guy band, right? It's, it's it, case closed. Yeah. What, what's funny is, is like, you really got to see it when we put out post human and you, we get interviews from like, you know, mainstream metal, you know, magazines or, you know, websites or whatever is like, they would be like, Oh, this sounds like mad ball. And don't get me wrong. I love mad ball. It's like one of my favorite bands but I don't think harm's way sounds like mad ball. Right. So that shows to me that they didn't even listen to the record. You know what I mean? And it's like, like, yeah, like mad ball is like probably one of my favorite bands of all time. And obviously I love New York hardcore, but like if you, I don't necessarily think harm's way sounds anything like mad ball. And then that's the first comparison you make in the new record. Right. You know, that just shows me that, you know, they probably didn't even listen to the record. They just looked at the band. Dude, I don't I they, don't know about that though. I, I think that I think that if you if you are convinced that it's going to be like a tough guy New York hardcore influence thing, and especially if you're not super knowledgeable about, you know, all the different potential influences and you don't and you're not necessarily a musician yourself who can kind of parse out like, oh, that part came from that, that part came from that. Sure. Right. That that you just you just hear what you expect to hear. Right. It's like the it's like the study where they they dyed white wine red, right? And gave it to sommeliers, and the sommeliers all treated it like it was red wine, right? Like you, it's easy to trick people if you give them uh, a, a, enough cues that that make them think that the thing is going sure. to be what they think it is. You know, I guess, I mean, I guess that's a good point. You know, I guess it's like, you know, cause like I would say, yeah, Madball is probably one of the most well-known hardcore bands 
of all time. So like maybe, you know, to someone who's reviewing metal only and they don't really, you know, dive into things that are closely related, you know, they might just pull from what they know. Like that makes sense to me, but it's, it's interesting to me when like you start to read reviews and people compare your band to other things. Um, you know, and, and to you, it's like, well, that, that's really not like what I was going for. Um, but you know, on top of that, aside from the actual listening of, of us, you know, people would always mention like me, like, oh, this is a tough guy, hardcore band, or like, this is, you know, and to me, like, like, that's embarrassing. I don't want to be like, I guess I don't want to be that. I want to be taken seriously. Yeah. You know, like, I like, you know, you know, my lyrics and, you know, the band and the music and all those things, you know, it's not like a joke to me. You know, I'm not trying like tough guy, hardcore to me, you know, obviously I like it in a lot of ways, but like, to me, like, you know, that's not like what harm's way is at all, you know? And, and it's sometimes hard. I understand like I get stereotyped into that category, but it's hard for me to like forgive people for like (laughs) judging me that way. Cause it's like, okay, well, fuck you then like i like your 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 magazine is trash your interview is trash like you don't know anything like that's how i react or how i want to react you know so but uh yeah it i mean that's that's an interesting interesting thing but i I understand harm's way is also you know we kind of grab from many different genres of music so well, it's also, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, right? Because you have sort of a, a an easy, again, sort of some easily pinpointable tribal identifiers, right? There, there's some sort of persona that people culturally have like an avatar of, and they're like, oh yeah, that guy, you know, he's got the, he's got the tattoos, he's got muscles, like he seems really angry. Like this is, this is great. This is what I want. So there, there's a benefit to that because it, it it's, it's sort of this avatar that exists in the culture that people can latch onto and then potentially pay attention to, right? So it gets people potentially in the door and then hopefully some percentage of them uh, potentially realize that there's there's more going on, right? That there's more, like you said, to the lyrics, that the the music isn't just about mosh parts or whatever. But, sure. you know, the, a larger percentage of people aren't. They're just going to see what they want to see and be like, oh yeah, tough guy, man. Yeah, no, I mean, and and that's and that's okay, obviously. I mean, obviously I want people to relate to the music however they want to, you know, and, and, and obviously I think one of the things that I'm happy or proud of that Harm's Way is able to do is play with many different tours. I mean, we've played with, with very different bands, you know, in the last, you know, two or three years, you know, we play with Cannibal Corpse, right. Which is, you know, completely different than playing with obviously Terror. And then we play with Ghost Mane. And like all those tours, you know, we basically were equally successful, you know, and, and that just kind of proved to me that like, you know, we kind of are in a, in a strange position where we're, we're, you can't really pinpoint the genre of music we are, you know, cause we use a, all these different elements, um, which to me makes, makes it, makes it great because we can kind of you know, expand our fan base or whatever in many different directions, you know, and we can go on any, pretty much any tour, you know, that involves a guitar, like we could probably like do okay on, which is, which is something that I don't think many bands can do. Yeah. Well, so I guess I'm curious then what are, what are the influences and what are the sounds that you want people to actually hear, right? If they, if they get past that initial impulse to be like, oh yeah, tough guy band, what do you want them to hear? Well, it's, to me, it's not necessarily about like what I want them to hear, but it's what I don't want to be categorized as, you know what I mean? Like, cause like, I don't want to be categorized as just like, you know, a silly mosh band. Like I, yeah. like I do not want that, you know? And, you know, you definitely, I mean, you definitely get to hear, you know, 
people talk about like, oh, like this song has like God flesh influences. And I'm like, okay, there we go. Like that person knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Because that's true. Like Harm's Way is very influenced by God flesh in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, obviously we also, I mean, and I've told you this before, but I think every single Harm's Way record is like half of the riffs come from like Chaos AD. Like that's like probably our most influential record on every single album. Yeah. You know, but there's also, you know, like on the last record, you know, Temptation, you know, is probably the most unique song we've ever, we ever wrote. And, you know, we kind of took some influences from like Jesus Lizard, which is like, Oh, I actually, I, I thought, I figured that was influenced by Converge. That's interesting. Well, ironically, Converge is r- really influenced by Jesus Lizard. Yeah, totally. In, in, in a lot of ways, you know, with, with those types of tracks. Right. You know, with a mid tempo track. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily want people to say, oh, this sounds like this or this sounds like that. I just want to be taken. You know, I want people to listen to the music as opposed to looking at me, you know, as, as the image and then judging the band based upon that. I could care less if people like or dislike the band or the music. I just want to be taken more seriously, you know, when it comes to certain people, because like I said, you know, that's something I've definitely experienced many times is people just look at our band and how we look and just write it off, you know, without even hearing or listening to the music. So, I mean, that's going to happen, but I think it happens more in the metal community, you know, um, when, when a band that's not like directly considered like death metal or metal, you know, you're kind of viewed as like, you know, just this infiltrator, like we kind of talked about from the wrong tribe. It's not, yeah, you're not, you're not in the right tribe. Cause like, obviously I don't have long hair that might help. Maybe I should grow it out to my shoulders or something. (laughs) I mean, that'd be cool. Wearing leather vests. That'd be cool. Yeah. I mean, that would be cool. (laughs) I, maybe I will. (laughs) Um, but I also, I also feel like as you get more fans and as you get more popular, that that problem only becomes worse, right? It never gets better that you, you only have people who actually understand what you're doing when you have very, very few fans, (laughs) because the more people who you're in front of, right? It's like, especially if you're someone who's into a lot of different kinds of music and, and it's kind of like, you know, okay, yeah, we have this part that we took from God flesh and this part that we took from fear factory and this part that we took from Jesus lizard and this part that we took from bolt thrower or whatever, right. That like the number of people who are going to pick up on all of that, like is probably in the hundreds in the world. Right. Oh so, yeah. No, I mean, no, that's, I mean, and that's the thing. I'm not necessarily wanting people to like recognize what we're necessarily influenced by, but just, you know, I just don't, like I said, I don't want to be like categorized as just like some yeah. silly mosh band. You know what I mean? And maybe that's my own fault. Maybe I should lose 50 pounds and keep my shirt on. I don't know. I mean, or just write worse mosh parts. Yeah, that's true. But hey, I like a good mosh part. Yeah. I mean, even in death metal, the, my favorite death metal bands are filled with, with fun mosh parts. <laughs> Like what? What are your what are your top five death metal mosh parts? Oh man, I did actually. I just made a, a playlist of uh, I met with uh, Walter from Riding Out. He asked me to to combine my top lifting songs, and number one was uh, Suffocation. The first song off Despise the Sun. I can't Legion, remember. Oh, I thought I thought you were gonna say Legion of Inveracity. I can't I'm blinking on the uh the track name right now for some reason. Yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know the title of the, uh, the first hold up, hold one. Up. I can pull it up real quick. 
So, oh yeah, Funeral Inception. That's the, that's like my favorite suffocation song, hands down. And I, and I've, in, in the breakdown to that is like, I, I always wait for the breakdown before I heavy deadlift. Like when I'm going maybe for a new, new PR or something like that's, that's the song for me. Yeah. You're like pacing back and forth in the gym. Yeah. Doing just smelling, like, doing smelling oh, salts, dude. waiting for it. I bet, you know, you want to know something funny? I've never used smelling salts ever my whole life. Cause like, I've, I've never, I've never like used them on purpose, but I used to coach with a guy who had them and he'd prank you, right? He'd sneak up behind you and just open them. And you're like, Oh my God, what's happening? I mean, to be honest, like, uh, to me, that's just like stupid, silly powerlifting <laughs> shit. Like, what, what, what are you going to sniff something and lift more? No. Like, what is it? Recruit more fast twitch muscle fibers? No. Like, like people who waste their money on stupid shit like that. I don't, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> that's just embarrassing, to be honest. Dude, get started. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I mean, dude, I. The thing is, man, like, I don't know. I mean, probably over the past five years, I think powerlifting has gotten pretty embarrassing, to be honest. You know, I think it's it's so, like, mainstream and it's so, like, so many people try and, like, make money off it that, like, it's just really tainted a lot of the, you know, aspects of powerlifting I always enjoyed, you know, so... You know, but, you know, it's just like, no matter what, like, I, I don't want to bash people for trying to like get into powerlifting or, you know, try and get into exercising. Cause obviously all of it's like in the end, trying to better yourself, which is good. But, you know, I think a lot of the powerlifting culture, you know, is just, I don't know. It's just so silly to me. Like you know, wearing wraps and knee sleeves and then wearing these contraptions and then doing these workouts to get, you know, my total. And then like all these silly deadlifting setups, you know, stopping <laughs> your feet and doing, and, and, and at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, all that stuff is just bullshit. You know what I mean? Like it, like, like <laughs> all that stuff is just dumb. And the thing is like, what's the bet? Like, you know, like, and the thing is, that's cool. Like some people, like, that's what they like doing, you know? But to me, like a lot of powerlifting culture is just like, it's a lot of people that get into this thing and then like, they're obsessed with it. Right. And they, and they, you know, do meets and they have a powerlifting team and, and all that thing. And, and they literally sacrifice every other thing in their life to lift weights. Okay. And, and that's fine if that's what someone wants to do. But at the end of the day, like lifting weights is lifting weights, right? It's, it's something that I do enjoy doing and have for many years, you know, and I like doing a, a meet from time to time, but like, am I going to sacrifice my life or my health or my social relationships, you know, to like get 25 pounds on my deadlift? No, you know, it's, it's just so... Like, I just feel like the whole thing is just so silly because there, you know, I mean, there's people out there that literally die, have died trying to deadlift a certain amount of weight, like, because they've taken all these PEDs and, you know, they're just extremely unhealthy, gain too much weight. And it's like, for what, you know, like how many powerlifters actually are professional and make money and that's their sole career. They don't do anything else. None, like practically zero, you know? So it's like, I just think like the whole culture of powerlifting is just, I don't know. It's, it's gotten really silly, you know? And, and, and I think it's just like, you know, how many likes can I get on Instagram? Yeah. That, that's know? what I was just going to ask. Cause in the, in the CrossFit world, the Instagram culture is really strange and toxic and actually like not good for a bunch of athletes because they see it and they feel like they should be participating in it and maybe they'll get some sponsorships, but they don't even necessarily want to do it, but they feel obligated to. And similarly, right? Only a few people are actually making real money. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors where it's like, oh, I have all these sponsors, but not really. They just send me a bag of protein every 
three months yeah. or something, right? It's just it's just all fake. Like everything about it is fake, and it, it just it it messes with people. It's not good. No, and the thing is, like, I mean, you and I both know there's not any amount of supplements you can take. There's not any amount of food. There's not a certain workout you can do, you know, that's going to really decipher the top tier power lifters from like someone who, you know, may not have those genetic advantages. Like, you know, powerlifting and, and CrossFit, a lot of it is genetically driven. Like the top guys, you know, would be, you know, superior athletes in pretty much anything they did because they're genetically gifted. You know what I mean? Like in powerlifting, you know, there's guys who are, you know, 165 who compete, who can deadlift over 700 pounds. You know what I mean? Like that's not normal, right? You're talking that that's like, there's, there's, you know, there's obviously a genetic advantage, you know, whether it's a leverage advantage, whether it's, you know, mat, you know, muscle, you know, fast muscle twitch fiber advantage, like there's something going on. Right. So, you know, to me, like powerlifting, it got to a point where it's like, what, what am I doing it for? You know, I'm never going to be the best. So it's individual. Like, are, you know, am I bettering myself? Is it healthy? And like, for me, a lot, you know, it was becoming unhealthy because my body is getting beat, beat to shit. You know, like, especially with going on tour, right? It's like, I mean, I, I mean, I talked to you for years about having back problems, yeah, shoulder problems. Totally. I mean, and it's like, what's the point? Like, that's not healthy. And like, at that point, you know, at, at some point, and it's usually when you get a little bit older, because when you get older, you start to feel that shit much harder on your body, you know? And it's for me, it's like, okay, well, yeah, I like lifting weights, but I don't need to do it like that anymore. You know, I have nothing to prove. Like, to be honest, I want to be pretty strong. I want to look pretty good and I want to be in shape. You know, I don't need to deadlift 700 pounds anymore. Like for what? You know, so I just feel like, you know, going back to like Instagram culture, right? A lot of those people, you know, they're comparing themselves to these elite power lifters. You know, these people that they will never achieve what the, they, you know, like comparing yourself to like someone like Larry wheels, right. Or, you know, a guy who's just like so genetically gifted and so strong, no one's ever going to get to that level. No normal person is, you know? And I think, you know, PEDs too, like, you know, we're talking about people moving to that. It's like, you know, that puts a lot of people's health at risk because they don't know or understand, you know, that a lot of that stuff, you know, it will never get them to that level. You know what I'm saying? Well, I think that one, one thing that I, that I see, which is interesting, and I'm curious if this is similar in the powerlifting world in the CrossFit world, there seems to be sort of a, a misconception that people can get to the elite level just by trying hard and dedicating themselves. Right. <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a way that, that, that doesn't seem to be applicable to a lot of other sports. And I'm sure that every sport has similar problems of people kind of having expectations that are way off and just not really understanding the dynamics of what's going on. Right. But like you said, people, sure. people are seeing Larry wheels on Instagram and they're like, Oh yeah, like if I just try hard enough, I can do that. Right. Whereas they would never have the conception like, Oh, I play in this rec basketball league. Like, and I saw this James Harden highlight on Twitter. Like I'm going to be James Harden. Like that, that that's, People aren't confused in the same way with <laughs> no. something like basketball as they seem to be in uh, like strength sports like CrossFit or, or powerlifting or whatever. Yeah, no, I, and I think, I think a big reason is, is because there isn't necessarily like, you know, I mean, I, obviously there is like the world championships and things like that. But when it comes to like, you know, anybody can like pick up weights or go to a crossfit class you know what i mean and like that that automatically kind of like puts you into this category of like going somewhere and doing something unique with with other people who have similar interests and probably some someone there is is going to be relatively strong so you kind of look at that person you're like oh i can get to that level whereas like if you go to like a park basketball court like it that's not it, for some reason and not taken like that seriously, you're not going to be like, Oh, like 
you know, scored 25 on, on the, you know, DuPage river <laughs> basketball court, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go try out for the NBA. Like yeah. that just doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So I think, you know, I, for, yeah, I think, I think people, I think people look at lifting weights as that thing where it's like, if I put in the time, I will get to that level. And that's just not true. You know, and, and I try to explain that to people who ask me, how did you get, you know, how did you get so big or, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, for one, I've been lifting for almost 20 years at this point. So, and the most I've ever taken off was this year, which was four months. And so most people can't even be consistent at the gym for two weeks. You know what I mean? And then on top of it, obviously I have good genetics. Like I can literally eat McDonald's every day and, and probably look Coke. pretty decent. Show us your Coke. Yeah, which I do. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I love Coke. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll literally drink a case of Coke a day. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Wait, tell, tell the story of the protein shake that you made with Coke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that that's a good one. Well, what's funny is I'll blame Flex Magazine because I got the recipe from Flex Magazine and it was a Jay Cutler recipe. And he said that he, well, actually, to be fair, in the, in the magazine, it stated, mix your protein with Coca-Cola in a bowl okay. with ice cubes and eat it like soup. Which sounds awful. First, yeah, for, I can't think of a, a more unappetizing thing on earth, to be honest. Like that, I mean, that that sounds like some real like. I, I don't even know why I did it, but for some reason I was like, oh, like maybe my protein shake would taste better if I added Coca Cola to it. And also in the in the article, they were explaining how like high fructose corn syrup, you know, respond, you know, gives you the insulin response post-workout, which is increases recovery or whatever. Totally. And great, great blend of, uh, uh, of, of fructose and glucose for, you yes. know, maximal glycogen yeah. replenishment. Totally. It, it was just driving, sense. driving it into the cells. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was driving into the cells when it exploded on the top of my ceiling, <laughs> because obviously when you shake a pop, it explodes. <laughs> and like, dude, we're talking like, just a flat out grenade of protein <laughs> and soda on the roof of my parents' house. <laughs> and I, I mean, obviously that was the last time I tried Jay Cutler's famous blend. Well, Maybe I should have tried the soup. Well, was it any good? Did you drink any of it or did it all just explode? You know what? I think I've tried, I've tried to do that another time since then. And dude, let's be honest, like protein powder sucks. Tastes like dog shit. I don't, I, I will never drink another protein shake in my life. I don't think <laughs> like, I don't ever want to touch another protein bar, another protein shake. I mean, supplements, like don't, don't ever try to fucking tell me supplement companies make good protein. All right. Because yeah. Okay. Maybe it helps you recover a little bit, but like protein sucks like and all like the flavors that you think are good suck too like oh i'm gonna get the s'mores flavor it's like oh this tastes like fucking dog shit like you know what i mean like that's the thing like not there's one protein that i've ever had that was actually tasted like a milkshake but it probably wasn't even healthy it was like uh it was it was actually a weight gainer um, MHP. I don't know if they make it anymore. I Dude, is it one of those years, things but... where it has like 700 calories per serving or whatever? <laughs> well, I never used the full serving because I was like, I don't need 50 grams of protein and 1,200 calories, obviously. But they had a cookies and cream, which historically cookies and cream was like the worst flavor ever from like optimum nutrition, like you thought like, oh, cookies and cream ice cream is going to taste just like that. And like, nah, it doesn't taste like fucking dirt. And 
the MHP though, up your mass. I used to take two scoops of that. And uh, that was quite good actually, because it wasn't, it was like thick enough, but it probably wasn't good for you. I don't know. I mean, dude, honestly, since I probably haven't drinking a protein shake after a workout in probably seven years, like I'll just eat steak or like eat a meal. You know what I mean? Or I'll take like, I, what I have been doing actually is taking those amino acid tablets or like an amino acid drink. Like BCAAs? Like, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I've, I mean, who fuck? I, 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 it doesn't matter. There's so much it doesn't matter. stupid articles yeah. about BCAAs. I mean, I just take, I just take EAAs, you know, like just give me, just give me the essential amino acid blend and call it a day. Like. If my muscles can't take those amino acids and they don't produce deserve results, them. then no, absolutely not. Have you been writing? Have no, you been I, writing any music in uh in in quarantine? Dude, you know. So the last time Harm's Way met as like a physical band was in like March twenty third, I think twenty twenty. Um, and since then it's been all Zoom practices, and we probably. I would say we probably wrote 70% of a record. Like it, it's there. Um, you know, obviously we're all just trying to wait till we get the vaccine and cause everyone's kind of in different situations, you know, we living with different people and, you know, I know like some people are more um, compromised than others as far as their immune systems. So, you know, we just try to be smart and keep it safe, you know, and, I think probably hopefully in the next month or two, you know, we'll be able to meet in person and start to to put everything that we wrote together. But yeah, we probably have 10, 12 songs um, that are like all written, um, which is, you know, I'll explain real quick. Basically what we did was we had uh, Casey had Ableton on his computer. So what we would do is um, we would run Ableton through a Twitch channel. Oh wow! Um, because because Twitch would actually be the true sound coming from Ableton. Yeah, like the the latency is probably pretty good on that, right? Because it's optimized. For yeah, it. yeah. Mm-hmm. So we would obviously open a Zoom meeting and like talk about what we wanted to do, or like you know, um, but as far as showing the parts and putting the songs together, it was all done through Twitch and on Ableton. And you know, we bought like some drum packs and stuff to basically replicate the drums like almost identical to what we normally would would sound like and obviously chris is a, a really good drummer so he's gonna like you know take whatever we wrote and like do his own thing drum wise but obviously it gives you like a really nice idea of like how you want the drums to sound and then like obviously it was really good for like structuring songs and you know obviously you really can't finish the song until you play it in person and, and kind of, you know, one of the big things for us is transitions. Like usually after playing the song a couple times, you know, is when we kind of start to think about transitioning from part to part a little bit more. But, um, I think as far as, you know, the, the main framework of, of music, I think it's, yeah, I would say it's about 70% finished. Um, and hopefully, you know, if all, if all things go well with, with the, you know, with, with, with the vaccine, um, you know, hopefully we can have the record out by early 2022. That's the goal. Um, so I, I'm, I'm yeah, curious about how, how this, write, <laughs> how this writing process worked. So you, what would, would, would you guys sort of like all come with riffs and then be like, Hey, I have this idea, I have this idea. And then Casey would program it together and bring it back the next time or would he come with a skeleton and then you would sort of chop it up? Like what, what actually happened? All right. So like Casey and Nick, they live together. So that was very helpful because, because uh, Nick is like one of the main contributors to, to writing music and coming up with, with riff. So basically like maybe he came up with a riff, he would show it to Casey, Casey would put drums before we'd even get on to like zoom. Right. And then like, they'd come to practice with like, Hey, like I wrote this, this is the the drums we had in mind. And, you know, obviously we would either be like, this is really cool. This isn't really something I'm into, or how about you try this? 
The only problem with that, right, is if you're in person, right, Chris can just do it. With doing electronically, you know, you, you basically have to say, well, all right, I now I have to reprogram it and go back and change the drums because obviously you have to change every measure, you know, when you're programming something, move, you know, whatever it is around. Um, but, you know, we were we were able to... You know, like I said, like we probably have 10 songs where it's like basically done. And, you know, we basically were like, just wrote parts, you know, put parts together. You know, a lot of, I mean, obviously this is a year's time. And a lot of the stuff was written probably the first three months of quarantining. And then the last three months, these last three months, we kind of took a hiatus for a while because I think a lot of us were, you know, burnt out a little bit. And also I think a lot of us were depressed because of the situation. And, you know, we really didn't want to work on music if we really didn't have a timeline of when we were going to be able to play shows again or put things out again, you know? So um, I think now that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, I think it kind of gave us an additional boost to, to start putting things back together again and going back and trying to revise some of the things that we, you know, that we created earlier. And like I said, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to meet in the next couple of months here and, and start to really, you know, finish everything up so that we can record in the fall and then get the record out early 2022 would be ideal, you know, which actually might be good timing because, you know, from what I've been hearing, you know, music is probably not even coming back to any normal capacity until October or November of 2021. Um, so, you know, if we can get a record out and then maybe start doing a tour or touring in the spring of 2022, I mean, I think that would be ideal for us. Um, Cause I mean, let's be honest when, when the, pandemic is i mean i don't know if it's ever going to be officially over but when the risks are reduced every band and their grandmother is going to go on tour you know so i think that that well and, and all some... the dates have already been sort of like pushed like oh yeah we'll do this you know our 2020 tour we push it to 2021 so i imagine even routing something is impossible well that's the thing too and then not to mention you know i think unfortunately a lot of the venues you know, have, have really took a hit from, uh, the, the whole, you know, coronavirus and, you know, definitely some of them are, don't even exist anymore. So now you're, I mean, you're probably talking about some limited places to play. Um, cause you got to think a lot of those places probably just strictly made revenue off yeah. shows. Although they, they did yeah. pass the save our stages legislation. So any of the venues that at least made it to that point, hopefully sure. got enough from that to be able to survive for another whatever six to nine months until shows start happening again. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think uh, the biggest problem is honestly going to be, you know, at what capacity are we going to be able to have shows? Are we going to have full audiences? You know, are we going to, you know, cause I think what's going to honestly happen is they'll probably say 30%. Yeah. 40% occupancy, which is a problem because, you know, when you're talking about going on tour, I mean, it's already low margin. Limit, it's already a low margin business. Exactly. So you're, you're, I mean, so selling out shows is might not even be doable or possible, which makes profit, you know, very tight, um, which I think could be problematic at first. And I think from what I've been hearing, you know, I think a lot of bands are also going to have to accept lower guarantees and offers because there isn't there is not going to be the money yeah you know well and there's not so, a buffer right if you get if you get screwed on a show where you're like oh i agreed to book this thing and i agreed to pay this guarantee and people didn't come out you know a lot of promoters and venues etc have kind of like a slush fund to be able to tolerate a certain amount of risk and at this point i think that that's probably not there right that that risk tolerance is going to be gone yeah, it's probably, and the thing is, it's probably completely drained. Like if they had funds, right. I mean, they're probably, you know, very, you know, very low. I mean, 
obviously the the business loans you know are probably good but you know a lot of those loans you have to pay back as well so it's yeah, I don't know. It's just, I don't think it's a great situation. Um, I think the industry in general is, you know, obviously I, I don't blame bands for, you know, putting out records during the pandemic, but I don't know. I mean, I think that that's a tough call because, you know, I think a lot of music that came out the, in the past year is just going to be lost. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause like you weren't able to tour on it. You weren't able to promote it the way you would normally would. And I think a lot of that hard work is, I don't want to say go to waste, but I think it's, it's definitely, you know, going to take a hit um, when it comes to, you know, when, when you're actually able to tour, you know, a lot of that stuff will be almost, you know, a year old at this point. Right. You know, so I, I mean, I think that was kind of part of the decision of why we kind of wanted to wait and see what happened before we, you know, put all this work into a record and, and maybe you, you don't even, you aren't even able to release it, you know? And so that, I think I kind of am, am it's kind of like, a, you know, obviously I, I would have wished that we would have been able to continue the way we had if the virus never happened, but it's kind of nice that we did what we did because we're kind of put in a position where now when, you know, shows are going to really start to happen at full capacity, you know, maybe that's when the record hits. And maybe we're able to go on tour without really skipping a beat, you know? So I'm hoping that's what happens at least. Yeah. Well, I mean, because you guys had built up a bunch of really solid momentum with post-human also, right? And it's like, okay, hopefully that's still there. Yeah, no, of course. I think that's also a concern, you know? I mean, at this point, or I guess when the record comes out then, that would have been four years since post-human came out, which is hard to believe. Yeah. Um, But... I think as long as we're able to kind of build some momentum before it comes out, I think, you know, maybe we'll be okay. Um, but I think obviously we're not alone in that. You know, I think a lot of bands are struggling to kind of find their way, you know, when you're not able to play live shows and, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of bands aren't able to meet up at all, you know, so it's, it's, it's just a really unique situation I never thought I would have to deal with. Um, but I guess the best thing you can do, I think, I think harm's way could we have done a better job and been, been a little more aggressive in, in the writing process, like during the pandemic, I think, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, but, you wrote a whole record, right? I mean, a lot, a lot of people, it's like, Oh, you have all this time. You can work on your creative stuff. But like you said, you know, that if you're emotionally drained enough and you don't have something that you're actually working toward because all the stuff that you do is shut down, it's extremely difficult to, to maintain the discipline to have creative output. So, I mean, I'm actually super impressed at, the amount of writing that you did. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that was a big part of it too. I mean, I, I know we've had, we had discussions that, you know, a lot of people were just, yeah, emotionally drained. Like, like they weren't able to, you know, use the creative outlet of music that they usually do because they just, they didn't have, um, they just didn't have the, the motivation to do it. And I, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of people are in the same boat, you know, whether it was music or other, other things, you know, I think a lot of people experienced depression and definitely were struggled with their own mental health because the outlets that they were normally able to, you know, use to deal with those things were just taken away completely. And, you know, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I mean, you know, not being able to work out as much you know, in the capacity that I, that I was doing, not being able to go to martial arts, you know, cause I was doing that, you know, two or three times a week, uh, Muay Thai. And that was kind of taken away from me. And then when it was brought back, I mean, I didn't feel like it was safe enough to go back. So that's not an outlet I was able to use. And then the band, of course, so we, we it's been a, over a year since we played a show 13 months. And, you know, obviously, you know, you and I both use music as, a, as an outlet to, you know, deal with, with certain things. And if that's removed completely, I mean, it's just, it puts you in a position where you're kind of just, 
you feel lost. That's how I felt. So I was happy that we were able to get where we, we are now. And I think, you know, we have to just keep a, a positive outlook and just try and try and look at that, uh, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel with this whole thing. And, and, you know, we'll be able to practice again soon and, and get, get things back to at least somewhat normal, which is, which is what I'm hoping for. Do you, do you still feel lost or do you feel like, okay, we've got this record done. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're, we're good to go. Uh, I think, I think there, I think there is some, some hesitancy um, when it comes to where, where we're going to be as a band, because I mean, you're talking, you know, almost a year and a half since we went on our last tour and, you know, life goes on, you know, you can't, you can't just sit there and, and hope that tomorrow, you know, the virus is going to vanish and, and you're going to be able to go back on tour and things are going to go back to being completely normal. I mean, obviously that's just not reality. Um, so I think one of the things that, uh, we just had to keep in mind is that, you know, people are going to be in different places. You know what I mean? And um, I think that it's just, it's just tough because it's just, you know, you're, I want, I want it to go back to the way it was before. I'm just not sure if that opportunity is going to be there based upon where we're going to be in our lives. You know what I mean? Totally. And because like for me, like I have to make a decision. Do I go and get a full-time teaching job? I mean, that opportunity most likely will be there in the fall, but if I get a full-time teaching job, then obviously I won't be able to go on tour until I have a break or whatever, you know? So I think that that like questions like that, like, do I continue with my career that I've been doing or do I go back to touring full-time, which is very uncertain on how successful it will be. And if, you know, the popularity and success will still be there to the capacity it was prior to the pandemic. Um, so I think, I think that's a, a mental challenge for everybody, to be honest. Yeah. Well, it's also at some level, it's just kind of like an empirical question, right? Like you just don't know. We have no idea. Right. That, no, it, that, that, you know, yeah. even, even if everything is like, okay, cool, you can go on tour. There's no capacity limits. Are people even going to come to shows? Right. I mean, people, some people will obviously come. But th that's that's another variable too. How how open are people even going to be be to be going to you know a large group indoor event? Well, that's the thing too. I mean, like like we you know we're talking about earlier, you know, before we we got on the podcast, um, you know, I mean, obviously the vaccine, obviously it's been proven to be effective, okay, but obviously we don't know what's going to happen maybe with some of the variants of the, of the virus? Will the vaccine be protective, you know, against those, you know, will, you know, someone like Dr. Fauci still encourage you to wear masks and not to gather at large events, you know, in six months, eight months. And, you know, obviously I was naive to the whole situation at first because I was like, oh, this will last two or three months, you know? And then it just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed. Obviously, now that we the vaccine is is out, obviously I think we're in a much better position um, to reduce risk. But I also think a lot of people are going to try and jump the gun a little too early, and you know I don't know if that's going to delay us getting back to normal or not. You know what I mean? Um, I think that that's a fear of mine as well. You know that people think we're in the clear and maybe we're not. Um, so that's, that's just kind of some things, uh, you know, I know, I know a lot of bands and a lot of people are hurting in that, in that regard, just cause there's too many unknowns. Um, but I think if you want it, I th like for us, like I said, we're kind of in a situation where we're definitely going to put out another record. It doesn't matter what happens, but 
as far as like, are we going to be able to tour the way we did before? I don't really know. I hope so. But I, but I mean, that's, I think that's a big question mark for not only us, but a lot of other bands as well. Yeah. Almost every band I think is probably having similar conversations and thoughts. Well, on a, on a more positive note, oh, there's that cola. There's that Coca-Cola. Tastes you gotta, good. You gotta, you gotta get a sip, you know? <laughs> what, uh, uh, if, if not, if not tough guy, what sounds are on these new songs? Uh, it's more like, uh, like grindcore, like the locust. Nice. Swoopy hair, white belts. Lots of, uh, youth, youth, large t shirts. It's kind of like Satia. <laughs> um, very emotional. Circle very takes orchid the square. Like. Planes mistaken for stars. Dude, that band is awesome. We're going DuPage, DuPage hardcore, uh, circa 2001. Um, nah, it's five I'll fingers half side. Dude, yeah, absolutely. Maybe some step forward, look west. No, actually, more of uh, Beneath the Wheel. Dude, underrated band. Dude, I mean... It's sad one, that, that the... nothing ever really came out, <laughs> honestly. Dude, what, what's funny, I mean, this is actually a funny story, is I saw Beneath the Wheel one time at the Darien Sportsplex. I must have only been a sophomore in high school. Maybe, maybe even a freshman. I can't remember. But I saw them and... The bassist was wearing a raw chicken around his bass strap <laughs> for some reason. Were you at that show by chance? I don't think I was there. Yeah, all right. So I was up front and at the show, I didn't know Drew Brown at the time. He threw a drumstick like as hard as he could in the crowd and it hit me in the face. <laughs> and uh, I should probably beat Drew up for that. I mean, you know. 20 years later, I mean, that was uncalled for. Punishment is due. No, but uh, in all seriousness, um, obviously the new Harm's Way has the Harm's Way feel to it. Obviously, it's going to be influenced by a lot of the similar bands that we have been. Um, But I will say it's it's a lot more technical. Um, It's... It's much more difficult to play than our previous material as far as timing um, and just just more chaotic, I I would say. But as far as it being heavy and electronically influenced, it's it still has going to have those elements. And um, I don't want to say, well, it's definitely it's, it's closer to converge, I would say, in a lot of ways than than our previous material. Um, just a lot more chaotic and a lot, a lot heavier. I mean, there's there's a couple of songs that we actually decided not to even include on the record because they were, they had like grind blasts and stuff. Um, you and think I, people it sounds, can handle it? Well, they were kind of like outliers, I would say. The, the those couple songs, sure. just because of. You know, they they just kind of didn't fit with the other material as much. But um, it's 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 funny because like the probably the first three or four songs we wrote is like straight up death metal record. Like it was just like like if Harm's Way started playing like newer sounding Cannibal Corpse. Yeah. And I love newer sounding Cannibal Corpse, but it just was like okay, well is this what we're trying to go for? Cause if it is, this is awesome. But if it's not, then like we kind of have to turn the corner a little bit on, you know, the, how, you know, the style that we're, that we're writing or whatever, but it, it's, I would, I'm really happy with a lot of the songs. I mean, obviously you still have, I have a lot to do, but I think in general, it's, it's going to be a really good record. And um, it's, it's definitely heavier, I would say, than a lot of the previous Harm's Way material in a lot of ways. Like, like it's, I, I hate to use this word, but it, it's more relentless, I would say. Are, are those death metal songs going to be on the record or are those the ones that are the outliers? Uh, 
I don't think we've completely decided yet. Um, I'm, I hope I want them to be, yeah, but me too. In, in the end, I don't know if it's going to fit like as a full piece of music with them on there. But we've also talked about hopefully doing another release before the actual record. So maybe we can do a couple of those songs on that. That'd be cool. Yeah, don't let them don't let them just fall to the wayside. Someone no, has I'll to just use them. them. I'll use them for hate force. There you go. That's a that's a good solution as well. <laughs> Cause yeah, we gotta come out of the woodwork as well. Yeah. That could work. We could do that. <laughs> um cool. All right, James. What uh what should people do if they want to listen to Harm's Way, if they wanna pay attention to you on the internet, where do they go? Uh but you can obviously uh I believe it's uh Harmsway thirteen on Instagram and Harms X Way on Twitter. Um and then I think it's Harms X Way as well on Facebook. Uh we have a website as well, Harmsway thirteen dot com. That's where you can find basically all the information about our upcoming tours. Um, it's got our music videos on there. It's got our uh, band store on there. So all the new merch that we put out goes up on there as well. Um, like that sweatshirt yeah, that's you're pretty wearing? Much, yeah. I've, it, anyone who doesn't wear their own band's merch, I mean, why would you make a shirt you wouldn't wear? Dude, this Jawbreaker you know sweatshirt I mean? that I'm wearing, I got from innerpunk.com like 20 Dude. years ago. <laughs> Dude, I used to I used to get a lot of shirts off Interpunk yeah. actually. You get shirts and pins. Dude, I you know, I used to get a lot of stuff from Interpunk and then No Idea Records. Totally. Used to have a distro. But you I remember what's funny, I mean, it's it's obviously we're not even that old, but I had to mail it in. I had to like oh, yeah. legitimately print something out, check off what I wanted, send a money order yep. to Florida to Gainesville so I could buy some weird political PC uh, Screamo records. Yeah. I love that. I used to love that stuff. Dude, I, I remember it. trying to convince my parents that this was like an okay thing to do where I'm like, no, it's, this isn't, this is fine. You should definitely let me mail a check to Gainesville or whatever. Yeah. I mean, for the vitamin X record, of yeah. course. <laughs> combat wounded veteran dude i i i ordered that record from uh no idea records as well the 10 inch i yeah. remember yeah what what's funny is a lot of those records are fucking terrible i haven't like, listened to legit. that in so long it's i mean it's so weird because some of it i think actually holds up and other stuff not at all dude some of that stuff is like straight up to the fire to the fire. <laughs> like they should be erased from musical history. <laughs> Cancel it. Like, dude, it should be. It should be canceled because that's how bad it is. Yeah. You know, but it, it, what's funny is like a lot of those bands, they're, they're like a lot of bands that are just time and place. You know, like I would never listen to like Spaz now or listen to like Charles Bronson now. But at the time, you know, I thought that those were like cool bands and they had like their place, you know, in my musical development, if you will. So I'm not ashamed of, of any of that stuff. But like, dude, now I, I would never listen to like 90% of that shit. No way. Well, there's also, I mean, I think a lot of that stuff isn't great to listen to per se, but it's good at what it does. But I also think it's sure. interesting because there's, I mean... Diff totally different situation, right? But I was into ska as like a seventh grader or whatever. And some of that stuff sure. is still pretty good, right? Like Slapstick, Less Than Jake, Mighty yeah. Mighty Boss Tones, like totally holds up. But some of the other stuff that I liked just as much, like Mustard Plug, sorry to put them on blast, but it's just so insanely bad. And you're like, this is, <laughs> this is really weird. I liked all these CDs approximately the same, and some of them are legitimately good, and some of them, as you mentioned, should just be burned. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll just, like, obviously, that, like, early 2000s, like, Screamo is, like, something I got into because of Nick Donahue, if yeah. you will, um, because that's just, like, 
what was I was that's what I was exposed to, especially living where you know in DuPage, like that's like what the scene was. But like, if I would have been exposed to floor punch earlier, I think I would have went that route because that's more of, you know, what I liked about you know the music and and hardcore. Um, was more, you know, New York's New York hardcore style or youth crew style. But I I knew of some of those bands, but like they didn't really exist in DuPage. You know, strength and numbers existed, but they were they like played their last show like when I was in eighth grade. Right. You know, before I was able to like actually go and 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 enjoy like those style of bands. So you know, and then obviously I couldn't drive, you know, so I was Trapped. You know, depending on Carl you're, Carl Schuster to you're trapped drive in me suburban to show. screamo hell. I was honestly <laughs> couldn't be yourself, dude. I was. I, I mean, th- I mean, think about this. Nick Donahue wouldn't even use mouthwash because they had alcohol in it. Oh, I mean, that's that's the type of shit we're talking about. Yeah. Ironically, he's not even straight edge anymore. Hasn't been for a long time. <laughs> but still but refuses like, to use mouthwash though. Still, yeah, <laughs> to this day. Dude, I there's so many funny Nick Donahue stories that I could talk about. <laughs> but that, we'll save that for another podcast. Dude, episode three of James Pliggy interviews. Dude, solely only, about Nick only old stories. No, no listeners. There will be zero listeners. <laughs> That's fine. It'd be funny. <laughs> <laughs>